All right, are we live? We are live. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Educator Innovator Hangout on Air. Uh, it's Thursday, August 14th, and today we'll be discussing poetry in the 21st century with national student poet uh, Louis LaFerre and a host of wonderful guests. Um, I am Paul O, and I'm joining the webinar from the National Writing Project offices in Berkeley, California. Today our guests are, along with Lewis, uh, Lisa New, professor of poetry at Harvard University, who uh, just joined us in the nick Hi. of time. <laughs> Lisa, Jeremy <laughs> Dean, chief of education at Genius.com, and Sarah Kay, founder of Project Voice. Um, but let's let our guests introduce themselves, starting on screen left. Um, so that would be uh, you, Jeremy. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Jeremy Dean. Uh, I'm the Chief of Education at Genius.com. I'm a former classroom teacher, taught high school for seven years, and got a PhD in English where I also taught at the college level. A uh, lifelong lover of words, literature, poetry, um, and now part of a startup that's really trying to uh, change the way that we read and write in the 21st century, so I'm really honored to be here. Great. Thanks, Jeremy. We're honored to have you. Um, Lisa, you're next. Oh, you've jumped, but that's fine. Hi, um, I'm Elisa New. I teach American poetry at Harvard University. For many years, I've taught big courses on the history of American poetry, and it's always been my, um, my special pleasure to initiate people who think they don't get poetry, don't like poetry, are confused by poetry, in some ways, the more freaked out they are, the more I, the more I like it. I should say from the outset that I am a 19th and early 20th century uh, specialist, and so I have as much to learn from this group and from what they might say about the new face of poetry um, as anybody else. Um, I tend to feel really, really secure with dead poets, <laughs> and with uh, and with living ones, I'm um, I'm in an absorbing and learning position. Wonderful, thank you, Lisa. Good to have you here, uh, Lewis. You're next on my left. All right, awesome. So, hey everyone, thanks for joining. My name is Lewis Lafair, uh, and so I had the honor this year to serve as, as a 2013 National Student Poet. Uh, and so I'll tell you a little bit more about that later, but I, I just graduated from high school. I'm heading off to college next year in California. and honored to be here, so thank you all for tuning in. Great, and I'll just add that Lewis was the one who assembled this uh, star-studded cast, and he's the one who's organized this entire thing, so he's, he's being modest as well about his role thank in this you. webinar. Way to go, Lewis. Yes, exactly. It should also be said that uh, Lewis is a former student of mine, so we, we go a, a way back uh, you know, as a teacher and student, and actually I learned quite a bit from him when he was in my classroom, and so uh, it's really great to still be connected to you, Lewis. Yeah, we have, we have some stories we'll have to tell during this. <laughs> Fantastic. And uh, next up is um, Sarah. Hi, my name's Sarah Kay. Um, I'm a spoken word poet from New York City, and... Um, I have been doing spoken word poetry since I was 14, and I started an organization called Project Voice, which uses spoken word poetry as an education tool in schools across the world. So we bring poets into classrooms and communities to perform poetry and then also to teach workshops to students of all ages. Um, so I spend most of my time living out of a suitcase and um, traveling to different schools, somewhat like a modern-day bard, I like to say. Um, <laughs> And because uh, I really am a traveling poet, that's what I do. Um, but I work a lot with um, a lot of people who uh, say that poetry isn't for them or they don't get poetry. So I loved what Lisa said. Um, that's a huge part of our mission is to make poetry more accessible and exciting, or not even make it, but just remind people that poetry um, is for everyone and can be for anyone um, is a big part of what I do. So thanks for having me. Great. Welcome, Sarah. All right, so uh, one thing uh, before we get started, um, if you're watching this Hangout from the Educator Innovator blog, uh, we encourage you to jump into the chat um, to talk with others who are watching. Uh, we'll be posting links to resources there throughout the webinar, and if you're watching somewhere else, uh, you can find the chat at the URL um, that we will post um, on screen. So 
uh, let's just jump right into uh, the conversation. Um, and I feel like I will only get in the way, so I'll, I'll uh, interject at different moments, but um, I'm sure that you all will be able to have your own organic, lively conversation. But I will just um, start us off with uh, one question, Lewis. You had mentioned National Student uh, Poets Program. I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about that program. Okay, yeah, of course. Um, so it's a relatively new program. This is the second year. The third year is about to start. Um, and essentially, it's a collaboration between the President's Committee on the Arts and the Humanities, the Institute of Museum and Library Services, um, and the Alliance for Young Artists and Writers. And just quickly, um, so how many of you have heard of the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards? I don't know if any of you have. No? I have. Jeremy, you have. Okay. Uh, so it's, it's a really cool program. It's the largest national writing competition for high school students and middle school students. Uh, but if you win a national award in that as a high school student, you go to a separate set of jurors, so people like Andrea Gibson and Terrence Hayes and Rob Casper and all of them, um, and they choose five people, one from each region of the U.S., to represent poetry. Uh, so I've been doing a decent amount of traveling this year as, as a literary ambassador, uh, working with students and teachers and others, um, and really just spreading my love of poetry with other people and peers. Um, and, and I think for me, a lot of it has been about, again, I mean, there's no such thing as getting or not getting poetry. They're simply experiencing poetry. And so, I mean, helping as many people understand that um, as possible. Because I think that, that, for me, was the biggest thing that helped me fall in love with poetry in the first place. Uh, but yeah, that's a brief synopsis. We, we do a lot of community service projects and other stuff. And this is actually one of my final, final events before the next, next class of poets uh, is inaugurated. So it's exciting. Wonderful. Well, we're honored. Uh, so let me let me ask, and this is a general question. I think everyone can jump in on this. Um, but Lewis, you alluded to this notion of falling in love with poetry. I'm wondering how how each of you uh, fell in love with poetry. I I'm just going to jump in and say I fell in love with poetry. Um, there was a a book that was published a few years before I was born. It was a golden book of the poems of Robert Louis Stevenson. And there was a poem called The Swing. Oh, how I love to go up in a swing, up in the air, so blue. I do think it the pleasantest thing ever a child can do. And I didn't read very well when I first read that poem. But I, I remember making my way through it, and this golden book had really, really beautiful illustrations. And then whenever I got on a swing, I would, I would say, oh, how I love to go up. And I would pump to go up in a swing, up in the air. And so I started as a really young child to feel poetry with my whole body and, um, and to think about poetry to think about the sound of poetry and the look of print on the page as it was speaking also to images on, in, a, in a beautiful illustrated book and to songs I sang in my head. And so it was a, it was a kind of wonderful way back in the early 60s to have an iPod experience um, without, without an iPod. That's fine. Uh, I'll go next. I, I hadn't uh, thought about this question. I hadn't thought about this question before uh, exactly, but um, I certainly first really got exposed to and interested in lyricism through music. Uh, and I say that not because I'm working at a, at a company at a, at a website that started off with music lyrics, but truly just because that was what we were listening to. And I think I followed uh, music lyrics, you know, pop music lyrics, uh, although I was more into some alternative sounds. Uh, into the Norton Anthology of Poetry that we had in our classroom and realizing uh, how close they were and, and what, they, what they did for my mind and for my heart uh, as a reader. Um, but I do want to mention one really formative, just in terms of falling in love moment with poetry, which was in, in college. Um, a friend of mine who's a poet, John Coletti, uh, who's a poet in New York, um, gave a reading, uh, just like, a, you know, I was at a, a dorm or something like that on campus, and performed a poem that was about a camping trip that we had taken, he and I and, and another friend of ours in college. And I remember just basically weeping profusely after, after the reading, because uh, I had never seen that exactly, which was somebody who had taken an experience uh, from their life, an experience that I shared, that I was present. I mean, I recognized my own memories, my own experiences in the lines of his poem, 
uh, and turn it into something that was just, uh, you know, I don't like the idea of elevated speech as a definition for poetry or elevated you know, language, but it really it transformed the experience at the same time that it, um, that it acknowledged it. And that was a pretty deep moment for me uh, in terms of poetry specifically and falling in love. Sarah, I'm really curious. <laughs> I was waiting for Louis to go. Um, I, uh, I've always loved wordplay when I was really little. Um, before I knew how to physically write, I used to chase my mom around the house and yell, poem, and make her write it down for me. Um, so I, I, I loved the, the rhyming and playing with words. Um, and when I was growing up from kindergarten through fourth grade, my parents um, every day would pack me lunch for school, and they would either one of them would write a little poem on a piece of paper and fold it in half and put it in my lunchbox. And the poems that they wrote were really short. Sometimes they rhymed, sometimes they didn't. Sometimes they were Dr. Seuss E or Shel Silverstein ish. Um, but they were always in my lunchbox. And so every single day of my school years from kindergarten through fourth grade, my lunch consisted of like waiting for my poem and opening it and finding it. So it was this combination of something I expected, something that was a surprise, something that was a ritual, something that um, I returned to every day, something that connected me to my parents, um, something that made me smile or made me think. Um, even before I knew that it was poetry, it was just like the notes that my parents would send me. Um, but so that instilled a, a great love of, of words and play and rhyme pretty early. And then um, I didn't have anything to do with performance uh, at all until I was 14 and I got accidentally signed up for a teen poetry slam uh, and by accidentally I mean that I received a letter in the mail that said Sarah Kay you've been registered to compete in the New York City teen poetry slam uh, and I did not sign myself up my parents didn't know anything about it none of my teachers no one has ever owned up to this um, you'd think at this point someone might have, but they haven't. Um, so I don't know how it happened, but I went to this teen poetry slam, um, and the experience of the slam itself was terrifying. I was not a performer. I had no experience with it. Um, it was absolutely <laughs> mainly awful. But afterwards, um, after I had performed my poem, um, another teenager in the audience came and sought me out and came to find me and like grabbed my shoulder and was like, hey, I want you to know I really felt that poem that you shared. Um, and to be a 14-year-old girl and to be told that something that I had created had moved a stranger in some way in their life um, absolutely hooked me. So that was like the, the lightning strike for me of when I decided, oh, this is, this is something I want more of. Very cool. Yeah, you would think someone would own up to uh, signing you up at this point. It <laughs> yeah. clearly made a big difference. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I've always loved playing with, with language and with words. But actually, I, I wrote mostly fiction uh, until really only two years ago. And uh, I guess two things happened. Is I, I one had, had this incredible teacher, shout out to Michael Sofranco if he's watching, um, during a summer program who, who really, I mean, I think for the first time taught me that I mean, we read all these poems in class, but those are only one type of poems, and there are so many more poems out there, modern-day poets and, and online poets and slam poets and spoken, and all sorts of different artists um, who write about a lot of different topics beyond what we read in school. Um, and so for that, and, and, that, and that poetry is just such an elegant way of playing with language um, in so many different ways. And, and so for that, that was a big transformation. Um, and then also, I began kind of watching a lot of poetry videos. So Sarah Kay's, your, your, uh, your TED Talk, and a bunch of other videos online, I think, really helped, helped me see, oh, wow, look at what poetry can do. Um, and so, yeah, thank you for that. And if anyone hasn't seen her TED Talk, they should go check it out. Check it out right, right now. Right now. Just right now, yeah. You can leave and, and minimize the words. Yeah, exactly. You can annotate it on uh, genius.com as well. Just, I don't know if you knew that, Sarah. but I don't think I knew that, no. Um, well, speaking of Genius.com, speaking of annotating poetry online and TED Talks online, uh, I think that, that brings me to another question, which, um, Louis, you, uh, in conversations with me, and I think in conversations with many others, talk about um, the new face of poetry. And uh, I'd love to hear your interpretation of that term. And uh, I just encourage everyone to jump in and, and begin talking about this notion of what uh, poetry looks like, or feels like, or is today. Yeah, um, so I mean it's, it's a pretty broad term on purpose, um, but I think it really just encompasses all of these new ways we get to experience poetry. Um, and so YouTube, for instance, has only been around for 10 years, uh, which is crazy to think about. 
But, uh, I mean, all the poems on there and all the stuff that we're seeing on social media, so Twitter haikus, um, you can now do found poetry using Google. Um, if you type, type a phrase into Google and you see the autocomplete suggestions, it's such a cool way to kind of create a new innovative type of poetry. And so all, like, these different mediums with which we get to interact with poetry, I see, I see kind of as the new face of poetry um, is how I would describe that term. But I don't know. What does everyone else think? I'd like to um, offer a defense of the old of some of the old ways <laughs> it's, experience, some and of the old ways not. experience poetry, um, the old the classroom. In fact, you know, you said poetry that you read in school, and I I too have um, sat, you know, with my eyelids heavy, mm -hmm. <laughs> listening to someone tell us that. It has, you know, I took that road, and it has made all the difference. Um, so, so I I know about that, and yet I, um, for thirty years, I've taught poetry, and every year it's new for somebody. Mm -hmm. Right? There is one teaches the same one one stands in a room, or sits around a seminar table or is in a, a high school classroom or a seventh grade classroom and there you are saying this is just to say I've eaten the plums that were in the icebox in which you were probably and right there in that room for the first time ever the, the flex, the, the aliveness, the ambiguity of those lines dawns on a person. And that that's because, in a way, of the ancient institution that Plato called symposium. <laughs> it's a social medium, a classroom, where we sit together, we gather together with a bunch of other people. It's a wonderful convenience of late adolescence in our culture. 18 to 21, you sit around with a bunch of other people in a classroom, you know, you've got a lot of other things on your mind. Some of the classrooms aren't that great. Um, and yet, I, even as some of you know, I'm venturing out into the online world. Um, I, I think we have an old institution, and I know Sarah spends a lot of time in these institutions too. We have this old institution that tells human beings it's important to convene to make meaning together and that we all can grow together as we make meaning. And so even as we all love reading poems online and annotating on genius, and I, I love it too, there's my defense of the classroom. Yeah, and no, I, and I'll say, I, and I love, I mean, I don't, I, I love didn't, the classroom I didn't mean, when I've had, yeah. I didn't mean <laughs> I, to give you a hard time, Lewis. <laughs> no, I know, I know. It's fun that way, though. Um, Lewis hates classrooms. Yeah, oh, I know. He's, I hate he's a very good student. I can attest for that. I can show you my grade book. No, I, I mean, I love the classroom. I just think um, that this, this quote-unquote new face can help supplement the classroom in, in a lot of cool ways. Um, and it's not always necessary. I mean, I think you also see the other end of the spectrum where teachers just use way, way, way too much technology um, without the reason why, and that doesn't help either. Um, it's more about finding, finding the balance and using whatever's most useful in the particular situation. Granted, mm -hmm. I'm not a teacher. I'm just, I'm just a student, so I have no idea what I'm, what I'm saying. But, uh, and I'm, I think, you know, Lisa's on to something, and, and, and I don't think that anybody needs to disagree here. I mean, I think that one, yeah. part of the, the tension here is, is a false one in the sense of, like, you know, I don't think people wrote letters. There might be some lament about the writing of letters and the dawn of email, but people are still writing. It's not right. different. It's, it's not, you know, radically different. There's still a lot to be shared, and I think that's also true um, with, the, with the classroom and with the new spaces that people can come together and have classroom-like experiences. And that's why I think that MOOCs are, are incredibly powerful. I mean, right. how many times can you multiply that moment of the dawning of the, you know, realization of a meaning of a, of a phrase in a poem? You know, I, I don't want to get rid of the brick and mortar or, or the page or anything like that, but you still have those opportunities on a MOOC. You still have those opportunities in the discussion forums, uh, with more people seeing that lecture, more people have that opportunity. Um, and for me, um, I think that uh, the new face of poetry, if I have to characterize it that way, is that it's, it's increasingly social. The classroom is a social space. Um, yep. More and more people are coming to poetry and, and, and engaging with poetry in social spaces like 
uh, Lit Genius or LightGenius.com, where there's a community of readers. Um, you know, I think back on a poem by Billy Collins about annotation called Marginalia, where he says, you know, I remember once looking up from my reading my thumb as a bookmark, trying to imagine what the person must look like who wrote, don't be a ninny, alongside a paragraph of the life of Emily Dickinson. And there's sort of different levels of readership there, right? There's the original annotator, who is presumably annotated in, in solo uh, in experiencing this text. Um, there's the second annotator who comes across the you know, who's, who's imagining uh, who wrote this other annotation. And I think that, you know, Genius.com and Lit Genius allow those two people uh, to meet um, and allow multiple, you know, allow groups of people to come together and read uh, in community and help each other have uh, that, you know, that, mo that dawning moment that uh, Lisa described. So for me, coming from, from Lit Genius, uh, it's the idea of reading in community, of uh, the social experience of the poem, which um, I do think, especially when you add some gamification and some uh, the sleekness of, it, of a social network to it, um, can allow more people to gain access to that moment. Um, because the classroom experience is one that um, probably everybody on this Hangout did really well in. Um, and you know was was there for that moment, um, but I don't know that everybody gets to have that moment in, in the way that uh, classrooms are set up uh, or the ways that different people learn. Um, and so I think that there are powerful new ways to extend the kind of experience that one has in a classroom um, beyond a physical space uh, and across you know lots of different types of uh, of people. I have sort of a question for Sarah who called herself a bard, and that seems com to me completely accurate, but I mean, is, is a bard a new way of presenting poetry to be a bard or an old, or an old way? No, I mean, it's a, it's a uh, purposeful tribute. Uh, uh. And I, I would say when I, when, I, when I get stuck in conversations like this, um, I'm always on one side of the uh, one side or the other of the same argument. So either I'm in a group of um, older people and they go, "Oh, spoken word poetry, that's that like young hip hop rap stuff. We don't like that." And I have to go, "No, no, 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 no. Uh, spoken word poetry is one of the most ancient art forms we have. Shakespeare was spoken word poetry, and Homer is spoken word poetry, and exactly. West African griots are speaking West, you know, are speaking spoken word poetry." And um, I have to say, like, no, this this is not a, a new phenomenon. It is an old one. Um, or <laughs> I'm in a classroom of young people, and they're like, "Man." Poetry is old, dead white guys, and I have to go. No, 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 wait. <laughs> but spoken word poetry is also young and new and current and hip hop and and you know and and singer songwriters and um, so th there's no right answer to it and there doesn't have to be. And a lot of times um, I have to you know make sure I say that it's not about page versus stage. Um, and likewise I don't think it's about analog versus digital. Um, I'm not really interested how people fall in love with poetry as long as they do fall in love with poetry um, or as long as they have the opportunity to fall in love with poetry. And I think that's what Jeremy was talking about is getting as many people access and opportunity to it as possible. So a lot of times I talk about spoken word poetry not as like the answer to literature but rather like um, what I use it as uh, as like a gateway drug to falling in love with literature literature at all. Um, and I've been in a lot of classrooms where people struggle with traditional forms of literacy like reading and writing. And if you're a kid who's been, um, you know, who has internalized the idea that I'm not good at reading or I'm not good at writing, the more you push on that, the less, you know, the more resistance mm -hmm. a student has. And one of the nice things about that I found with spoken word poetry is it sort of, you know, it, it goes around that and it says, okay, cool, you don't like reading and writing? fine, not a problem. I don't need to look at the page at all. I want you to tell me a story. I want you to use your words to create language that you allows you to communicate something that you care about. And so when someone is able to do that, it creates the potential for a very empowering moment where they can go like, oh, wait a second, I actually have control over language in a way that I maybe previously didn't feel like I had it. And then all of a sudden, language becomes something that is a tool to them as opposed to an uh, inhibition. It's okay. So that's 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 how I feel about it. Is that... Yeah, no, I love that description of it all. That's it's a great way of looking at it. Um, I mean, quickly for anyone who isn't viewing, I mean, I think all of us here 
use different methods for trying to give as many people as much opportunity to fall in love with poetry as possible. I think it might be helpful if just quickly you guys describe Project Voice and Poetry in America, the MOOC slash potentially TV show, um, and Genius.com, just to give people a, a brief sense of, of the different things you're doing, because um, they're all fascinating in their own ways. I, I just talked a lot, so someone oh, yeah. else. Yeah, oh, jump in. Just talked a lot. Um, so Genius.com has a, a literary channel where our, our literature uh, and our, our fiction and poetry is housed. Um, so that's where people are experiencing poetry. Although you know, rap lyrics are poetry, rock lyrics are poetry. We have tremendous amount of lyrical content. That's how we made our name, and then extended out into uh, into other you know areas of textual uh, content. But you know, Genius.com is an annotation platform. Um, it is a way to annotate text uh, collaboratively um, and through all the multimedia tools that writing and reading online uh, allow. Um, and so I think the, the number one amazing thing about uh, Lit Genius, uh, which actually used to be called Poetry Genius, um, uh, is that it's a community uh, of readers. Uh, it's a community of people that come together uh, and are annotating their favorite works. Sometimes uh, in isolation, you know, maybe there's the one, um, you know, I'm trying to think of somebody super old school, uh, and since I was just looking at some of Lisa's curriculum, uh, Wigglesworth, I really like <laughs> that name from your uh, current syllabus, you know, maybe there's the one it's Wigglesworth scholar on, gene, on lit genius annotating some Puritan uh, or New England poetry, um, but then there's a lot of people, you know, piling on 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 more contemporary popular work, lots of people finding each other um, in the you know digital pages of Whitman. Um, we have uh, you know discussion forums on the site. We have social media like Twitter uh, and Facebook where people are sort of seeing what's going on. And every day of the week, we have a text of the day that we announce through our social media and on the front page of Lit Genius. And so all the folks on the site that are getting those messages that are paying attention. Uh, you know, converge on a single text every day. So yesterday we were all working on uh, a series of Elizabeth Bishop poems. We, we decided this week was Water Week, and so everything is water themed. And so we were all working on three Elizabeth Bishop poems, and we're all, you know, several dozen uh, sort of rogue literary scholars around the internet and different places around the world um, coming together and thinking through uh, poetry in community. Um, and that's the vision. Uh, that's the beginning of the vision, and the vision ultimately is to have the authors involved in that conversation, uh, annotating their own work, responding to their fans, responding to their readers, having experts, uh, uh, scholars like, like Lisa involved, annotating text, uh, and responding to a larger you know, classroom, quote unquote classroom, of, uh, of people that are interested in learning more about poetry. Um, so it's an annotation platform, but it's really a community of uh, rogue scholars, as I said, coming together and helping each other appreciate, helping each other understand uh, difficult and beautiful text. Should I jump in? Yeah, go ahead. I, um, your, so yeah, I go. love what I love what Jeremy is doing, and Jeremy is um, going to throw the poetry of the early American of early New England out into his community, a community that I, I think kind of came of age interpreting hip-hop and now they have an opportunity to read um, the uh, Puritan verse of uh, Cape Cod from 1640 and we're gonna we're gonna see how how that goes um, but that beautiful idea Jeremy was articulating of a community across the world uh, coming together to focus on one poet is um, is really really moving to me. Um, what I've been doing uh, over the last few years is walking my way out of the classroom and into what we're all starting, I guess, to call here a bigger a bigger classroom. I'm uh, teaching online a course that covers the whole history of American poetry uh, beginning with the American Puritans and going uh, going into the 21st century and that that in itself has been extraordinary we've only run a few parts of this course but you know there are people in Saudi Arabia and Kuala Lumpur and Japan and Brazil and there they are reading Anne Bradstreet 
um, we we film Anne Bradstreet's environs, and they say, "I've never seen the leaves I've heard described." Uh, you know, the leaves of autumn, and so it's been amazing for me to be able to use um, to use video uh, in order to um, make the experience of readers around the world uh, that much more rich. What What's also happened uh, as I've as I began teaching this course is I started to think, well, how can I draw more and more people in? Yes, I can convene little seminars of my students and we can film that. Um, yes, I can go to the Song of Myself marathon under the Brooklyn Bridge and listen to those readers and then bring particularly um, interesting ones out into the trees and we can have little, se little spontaneous seminars where we read a few lines of Whitman together. What if I go out into the world and begin to invite people who may or may not like poetry but who, may, but who are probably well known to others. What if I have conversations on camera with TV anchors and famous basketball players and presidents and actors? And I started to do that. And what I've discovered is that Katie Couric loves Elizabeth Bishop and cherishes lines of Elizabeth Bishop and has extraordinary things to teach me about how to read Elizabeth Bishop. What I've discovered is that Bill Clinton really cares about Langston Hughes and has insights into Langston Hughes that are very much like the insights of seventh graders who um, study in the Harlem Children's Zone. Um, what I've learned is that even though Justice Elena Kagan says she doesn't like poetry, <laughs> um, she and I, uh, and probably any uh, attorney and any scholar of poetry, can absolutely understand each other since allusion and precedent are in some profound way analogous and the same. So what I've been doing uh, is uh, having conversations that uh, are now developing into a uh, into a TV series. It seems I've been having conversations with extraordinary people we might not associate with poetry, and also drawing poets into those con practicing poets into those conversations, and all sorts of citizens into those conversations um, as a way to uh, to to show this larger this larger classroom of which we are all a part that language is what we all share that we all do in fact have access to it that a poem is not a mysterious and opaque set of symbols we uh, it's not our enemy <laughs> uh, it's not a surface under which we we if we battle through in order to get to a depth. It's instead, as just as Lewis said, um, an experience, a, uh, a, a an arrangement of words that will affect readers often in similar ways, uh, often in ways that will allow their their differences and just the ambiguity and instability of, uh, of human experience to, um, to help them to sort out. So, so I've been part of a, a kind of great adventure in bringing more and more readers together uh, in a, on film. Uh, and uh, it's been really amazing. It's been really amazing. All right. Sarah, I think your turn now. Oh, is it my turn? You didn't have something that you wanted to share about? You can, uh, sure, I'll go. I mean, I can go quickly. Um, all right, so well, through the National Student Poets Program, I've been working a lot 
um, with teachers and other students. Um, I'm actually leaving for Arizona tomorrow and then a bunch of other events, just really talking to them and working with them and um, doing a bunch of different workshops. Um, but in specific to this webinar in particular, I just launched a website called poetry2.0.com uh, that essentially just compiles all of these new ways to experience experience poetry, so stuff like Genius.com and MOOCs and Project Voice, um, and it sticks them all on a page, along with a bunch of my favorite poems um, and a bunch of other kind of things that I just I really enjoy, um, because all this stuff is out there, and, and what I found is that very few people know about all of it. So, I mean, there, there is everything from, um, I don't know if you've seen, but a scientist embedded a poem into a, into a gene, which is completely irrelevant and doesn't affect classroom at all, into, into a, the gene of a bacterium. So like all oh. sorts of crazy random things are happening with poetry. Um, not that anyone would ever use that fact in a classroom, but I think it's interesting how different poets um, are reacting to today's society. Um, one of the cool things, there's, there's a game called Bot or Not, where um, botpoet.com, I think, um, where a, you, you get a poem and you have to guess whether a human or a robot wrote it. And it's actually a lot harder than you would think because there's some really I mean, human-sounding robot poems and some really strange-sounding human poems. Uh, and so there are a lot of, like, really fun, random activities like that that I just think are really cool and exciting. Um, and so Poetry2.0.com just compiles all of those. Um, so I just launched today, so that's exciting. Thank that's you, Lewis, for that. Congratulations. All of yes. Um, all right. That's yeah. awesome. Do you know, uh, just out of curiosity, do you know the poet Reeves? And do you know that yes, he's for a while? Yes, yes, I, I actually was, met him. Um, he's on the site, too. Um, oh. And I just, I met him, I think, last year um, at he a was, TEDx he, event, actually. He was like, coin, I don't know who coined it, but... The first... The first 2.0 poet. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I'm sending a link to him probably tomorrow. Uh, but yeah, he's, he's an awesome guy. He's def cool. He does a lot of fascinating things with that. Right. Thanks for right. thanks for bringing him up. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, so, what am I supposed to talk about? Pro what Project Voice is? Project Voice. Yeah. You do a so lot of project, cool things too. <laughs> um, project Voice is. Um, well, I sort of gave that spiel in my in my yeah. opening, but um, but basically, it's an organization that brings spoken word poetry into classrooms and communities around the world, specifically with an eye towards how this art form can be used within education. So. Um, I've been doing spoken word poetry since I was uh, 14, but then um, I started teaching it when I was in college, and um, I found that it was incredibly helpful, um, but I was doing all after-school workshops, and I went back to grad school um, to get my master's degree in the art of teaching, um, and I all of the research I could find on spoken word poetry in education was all like, oh yeah, this is a really cute extracurricular that kids can do after school if they want to, or like, yeah, start a club, that's fun, um, and I was really genuinely convinced that there's more to it than that, than that, that, like I said, you can use spoken word poetry as a gateway drug to loving literature in general, and also just as an actual... Um, uh, just a, a different form through which you can teach a lot of other things that you would also teach through any other um, forms as well, and that it can be very useful to a lot of educators. So I spent a lot of time researching and doing a lot of work on how we can use spoken word poetry in a traditional classroom. And so a lot of my work is how can we use this art form to be helpful to teachers and students to kind of innovate the curriculum that we're trying to teach and make it more accessible to a lot of people and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's like the background stuff. But on a day-to-day -day basis, what that means is that myself and then I also work with two other poets, Phil Kay and Franny Choi, and the three of us are the team and we rotate. Um, and sometimes we're together, sometimes we're by ourselves, but we go to schools around the country and also around the world and we are we perform spoken word poetry and then we also teach workshops and those workshops um, sometimes are just basics introductions to the art form how people can start trying it out themselves um, sometimes it's more advanced it's more focused on specific elements of writing or specific elements of performance or presentation um, sometimes it's used in a social justice uh, context um, there's lots of different ways to use this art form and we one of the cool things because we're sort of small and streamlined is that we're able to really tailor all of the work we do based on what school we're visiting and what age group we're working with. We work with kids as young as kindergartners and then every single grade up 
through college and adulthood and wow. senior citizens because um, I believe that you're never too young or too old for yeah. poetry. But obviously the way we teach a kindergarten class is very different from the way that we teach a college class. Uh, so there's a lot of tailoring and a lot of changing that goes into the curriculums and the work that we do. Um, but mainly it's about introducing people to this art form or if they're already familiar with it experimenting with how this art form can be helpful in um, education literacy empowerment confidence empathy passion etc you know I wanted to jump in for a second and uh, pick up on something that Sarah was uh, just talking about um, which is this notion of uh, poetry being used um, particularly spoken word poetry being used for curricular purposes in school um, it reminds me of a project that I heard about recently uh, called the Off Page Project, in which uh, Youth Speaks, a, a spoken word group uh, based in the Bay Area, has teamed up with the Center for Investigative Reporting um, to essentially give young people this opportunity to uh, to write poetry about the issues that matter to them, but based um, as well or infused with um, or related to um, research that the Center for Investigative Reporting has done. Um, about those particular issues in their community, it's this uh, you know it's this amazing um, project I think, and uh, and when you talked to Sarah about the fact that uh, there has been this attitude about poetry that it's something that is perhaps uh, you know a, a curricular extra versus something that you know perhaps is um, fundamental in terms of thinking about well, what does it mean to um, you know to teach uh, what does it mean to learn um, what does it mean to be part of a, a you know community um, a literary community um, or even in terms of you know issues of social justice I wonder if uh, people could speak to that at all um, as educators uh, uh, or at least Lewis as someone who has been educated as well um, because I think I think that that's that's an issue that uh, I think comes up particularly these days in the way in which um, I, I don't know how familiar you all are with you know, the common core curriculum which um, tends for many educators to be a signal that you know they should move away from the creative art forms in terms of their educational spaces. I I was just I was thinking as um, as the two of you were talking about just what are those developmental what are those skills what are those capacities what are those forms of confidence that spoken word poetry or or reading poetry on the page even can give children or even learners of all ages and and I'm I'm really I'm really interested in what Sarah would say I mean I I do have um, the experience in watching students you know this is it's almost a cliche, but to say, but I, I think I have to just use it. Find their voice, right? You say poetry is about the voice. It's about speaking up. Um, sometimes I think speaking absolutely in one's own voice, without the, um, w without the 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 separation from the self that a that a form like poetry affords is harder I mean I I, I wonder and you might say I, I I expect there could be pushback but I I wonder if saying speak your truth speak your inner self in a poem does that give a person more freedom right that that this isn't this isn't just me speaking myself unmediated cold this is this is me performing in a in a in a genre that already exists and while you while you mull that I'll, I'll just say that um, for me uh, talking with other human beings about poetry is um, it's it's such a privilege to watch people find their their own analytic, their own intellectual perspective, their own personality, their own style, their own stamp. And there's something, you know, sort of like if you're going to go on a date, it's good to do something with another person <laughs> instead of just talk about what your job is. Go to a museum, go to a concert, go have an, have an object between you. And I guess both of my questions 
orient us away from just poetry as it allows us to speak in our, our very own inner self. Does that does that make sense to any of you? Yeah, I mean, I'll just jump in quickly. Um, so, I mean, to an extent, yeah, it is about finding your own voice and expressing yourself and, and figuring out um, what you are trying to say. Um, I think poetry helps me work through a lot of issues. It, with all the other poets I've talked to, it helps them work through their own issues. Um, so that is a large part of poetry. But then I also think that it is much about empathy and stories and kind of getting a sense for everyone else. And I think what's so uh, beautiful about poetry is, is that you get to hear all of these stories in, in a pretty short amount of time from so many different people um, and really experience that and realize that, that no human has a single story, um, that we're made up of lots of different backgrounds and experiences and... Uh, and trying to get those out there, um, I think is I think that to me is is what poetry helps with. And and we were talking about skills. I mean, I think definitely empathy, um, confidence. I mean, with spoken word poetry in particular, um, this year I presented at a lot lot more events than I had in the past. And I mean, now I'll go anywhere. We in our at our last we were in Aspen with you at the Aspen Ideas Festival, um, and we did what I call flash mob poetry in front of a random set of people on a on a street corner. Um, would have never done that before, but if you look at kind of the way spoken word poetry helps people realize that yes, their voice is important and their stories are important um, and they're worth sharing. Um, and it's worth listening to other people's stories too. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Sarah, what's, what would you... <laughs> it's a lot of random things integrated into that. But uh, Yeah, I mean, the way, that we, the way that I was always taught and the way that I think about teaching poetry is that it's always... it's equally important to speak as it is to listen the right. way we talk about it. So right. there's a lot of people who um, are more comfortable listening and would just rather other people speak for them. And we try to remind them that if you don't tell your story, someone else is going to try to do it and they won't do it the way you could and the way, in, you know, in the words that you should use, could use and, you know, have the ability to tell it your way. And then there are other people who love to hear themselves talk and don't want to listen to anybody. And they have to be reminded that, like, no, there are other perspectives and other points of view. And, uh, like, like you're saying, that, that um, learning empathy and learning how to bear witness and learning how to just shut up and listen is an absolute skill set that we expect grown-ups to be able to do in this world, but also, like, never actually teach um, concretely, right? Like you don't have a listening class in school. You mm -hmm. just hope that someone will eventually get it. And so one of the things that I talk a lot about is that I teach spoken word poetry, yes, and it's from a deep love of poetry for me, but also I'm not teaching it because I'm trying to create an army of poets. Uh, that's not my focus per se, although that would be awesome, sure. <laughs> um, but it's because I think think that there are a lot of opportunities through this art form that I've found to teach a lot of other life skills that I think we could all agree are really important, but are perhaps being left out of a lot of education uh, spaces because of harsh, strict curriculum limitations and requirements, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and teachers have a lot to deal with, you know, and, and they can't always tackle minutia details the way that they even would like to. Um, so this allows me to do things like make uh, make empathy a habit or or at least a ritual you know and and community and have how to be a member of a community how to use your critical thinking skills how to take a text and analyze it how to read subtext how to understand metaphor you know all of these things I think all of us here on this panel would agree are are worthwhile endeavors that people should be able to figure out but a lot of times they don't have any actual concrete training in it so um, for the work that we do specifically we're working on a lot of things that have nothing to do with poetry. And in my opinion, if the mm -hmm. kids I teach never end up writing a single poem, um, I think that'll be a waste, but I would be fine with that. If they if they use this stuff in other parts of their life, then I think the, the work is still worth it. Um, so, th but that's not to say that like the study of poetry for the sake of poetry and for the love of literature isn't also important. Um, but I also think that like perhaps that's more of the work that is being done by Lisa in like a college setting um, in a space where people have already made the jump to sort of love literature or be curious about literature or want to learn more about it in that form, in that space. And I think my my work is in a, just a slightly, you know, same same team, same, same side, but just in a slightly different uh, framework perhaps is what I would say to all that. Hey, I'd like to chime in here. Uh, Please do. <laughs> um, I think uh, one interesting thing that I'm hearing, and uh, speaking from my own experience, and this is a, almost too simple, and goes back to Paul's um, characterization of the Common Core, which I by no means you know want to defend or or uh, necessarily speak on directly. But one thing you mentioned, Paul, is that you know traditional academic skills uh, can be creative, 
And I think part of the reason that like maybe analysis is not considered a, a creative form of writing um, is, is a problem in our curriculum. But I think that uh, it truly is. Um, I think that writing online has probably opened up a lot of people to being more critical, more analytic, writing more just because of the uh, informality of, uh, that, 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 the, that is allowed in the language and also the, playful, the playfulness that's allowed in analysis. And we see that online at, at Genius. I mean, we start off as a rap music uh, website, so um, the voice of annotation uh, is not the Norton Anthology of Poetry voice of, of notation. Uh, it's a different kind of annotation. I think we see all the time young people who are coming, you know, who are finding their voices uh, as, 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 as critics, as scholars on the site um, because they realize, A, you can speak that way about lyrics, uh, and B, you can, you know, speak playfully uh, and then have fun speaking that way about literature. Um, and I, that's always been my, uh, you know, student philosophy and teaching philosophy is that, like I said earlier, I came to the Norton Anthology through the music I was listening to. And as a teacher, and Lewis can attest to this, um, I used a lot of popular culture in my class uh, as a hook to say, this is not different. Uh, the study of literature is not different from how you speak about the movie you just saw as you, as you leave the movie, or how you're debating about the lyrics of a rap song uh, in the hall uh, before class. And I think that that's also true about writing uh, in these formats. Um, that, you know, you mentioned the word leap, uh, Sarah, and I'm not picking on you at all, but I mean, it, it's not a, a leap in the sense, like, we all have this uh, in ourselves. That, you know, anybody that's ever played with language uh, is a poet. Uh, and it's about, you know, honing that voice and crafting that, you know, that playfulness. Um, but, you know, I think we, we set up too many differences between uh, you know, poetry as a, as a form that's, that's so different from how we speak and think and experience, and um, I think we need to break down those barriers that we're all yeah. just sort of playing with words, and uh, the babies do it, and, and academics do it. I mean, I just... And it's, and it's emancipated. You know, when you, <laughs> when you write, when, when you annotate a poem on a site, you get to be an experimental you, right? You, you, act, you are actually invisible, you know, and there's, we haven't talked that much about performance and what it does for human beings, in, for expressive human beings, and for writing, which is, yes, in some ways a kind of performance, but it's not performance in your, in your person with your, Body and there is this there is this veil in a certain way and I, I love the way writing um, immense analytic writing is immensely creative you get to decide you get to choose the terms right you you get to choose the terms you get to be who you want to be you have a voice that sounds like this it's snarky it's authoritative it's lyrical it's it's colloquial. Um, and you get to figure out, well, does that voice work for that audience? Do I care? <laughs> right? And that, I mean, that's a, that's a poet's question. How much do I care about audience? Am I? Not all poetry. We've been all talking about empathy, and I apps couldn't agree more that to read poetry is to listen to another person's voice and to make, uh, and sometimes to make a leap into, uh, into their experience. Um, and yet, not all poems are are empathetic, or even are even addressed to another person, right? Sometimes some poetry uh, is addressed to language itself, or some poetry um, doesn't actually even emanate from a human being, right? So there are plenty of plenty of uh, contemporary poems that are written as if there were no human interior, and I love the. Uh, I love the way in which our language migrates in and out of the human, <laughs> right? We we all are humans. We get up in the morning. We you know brush our teeth. We go to we go to school. We have we have our feelings, and yet language lives all around us. Um, not only, not only in us, and so, and I think that participating in poetry, whether as listener, as performer 
as writer, um, attunes us more and more to this ambient stuff, this environment in which we live, which is linguistic. Wow, I'm signing up for your course, Lisa. I know exactly. That was that was my feeling, Jeremy. I could listen to you talk for a long time. Well, we we talk. We're starting to talk more and more. We haven't really said that a number of us are already in conversation, and now we all are. Um, now we all are. Yes, and and I hate to be the person to jump in and say that we are coming to the end of our hour um, together, uh, which is really unfortunate from my perspective because I have loved uh, every word that you all have uttered today uh, and um, I feel fortunate that this is recorded and will be an archive that I can revisit and I hope others uh, do the same. Um, I just wanted to thank you all for being willing to be on this webinar and to talk about uh, this uh, wonderful topic of uh, poetry today um, and uh, as, uh, before we go, I just wanted to say that um, we wanted to not only thank you all, but also let the audience know that um, if the audience is interested in learning more about uh, connected learning, which is the undergirding principle for all the work that happens here at Educator Innovator, um, they should check out the Connected Learning Alliance at clalliance.org, uh, where there are great testimonials from practitioners, um, which might be considered in some cases poetic, I have to say. Uh, and if you'd like to keep abreast of future opportunities from Educator Innovator and um, partners like the um, Alliance, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Scholastic um, Young Artists and Writers. Art and Writing Awards. Art and Writing Awards, exactly. Um, you can sign up for a monthly newsletter. But again, I just wanted to thank each and every one of you for contributing today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paul. Thank, thank you, Paul. You. We're all here, Elf. Yeah. Great thank having you on with you. All right. Well, good night, everyone. Okay.